Hello and welcome to today's webinar on future-proofing your software monetization strategy. My name is Chris Cahill. I'm part of the product marketing team here at Revenera. And today I'm joined by Ravi Trivedi, the senior product manager of FlexNet Licensing, and Michael Goff, principal of product marketing for software monetization. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Great to see you both. Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> Um, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please do add them to the Q&A tab. Uh, we'd love for this to be an interactive session, so don't be shy. Ask away if you have something to say. Um, okay, so the, the idea for today's webinar came off the back of the recently published Monetization Monitor reports, which Michael and I collaborated on alongside Jenny from our PR team. And ultimately, we surveyed 454 senior leaders at global technology companies to gauge the latest industry trends in software monetization, usage analytics, and compliance. If you haven't already done so, please do download these reports. Um, if you're joining us live, the first two reports in the series are available in the handout section to the right of the screen, um, or uh, you can head to revenera.com slash resources and access them there. Um, Essentially, if you are a stakeholder in software monetization at your company, uh, these reports are designed for you um, with input from more than 450 product leaders. Uh, we have significant data that allows you to see how your strategies compare to the competition. And the results are, are quite fascinating. So we've seen some pretty huge shifts in direction this year. Um, and today we're going to talk through the rise of usage-based pricing models, the growth of hybrid monetization, and the biggest barriers to revenue growth. Uh, and why does this matter? So ultimately, your company leadership wants you to grow recurring revenue, take products to market as quickly as possible to capture new revenue streams and boost company valuations, as well as improving product functionality to earn customer loyalty. And hopefully Hopefully, the insights we're going to share today can help you in those efforts. Uh, so firstly, as we look at the monetization model trends, it will come as no surprise that subscription term models are top of the list for expected growth as a percentage for overall, overall revenue. Um, in fact, 82% of companies now use subscription models, at least moderately, which is up from 68% last year, 14% rise. Um, but what really stands out is this middle section here. So with consumption tied at the top alongside subscription on 59% and metered and outcome or value-based models showing significant growth at 48% each. Uh, so on average, each of these usage-based models are up by around 20% compared to last year, which marks a, a pretty big shift in monetization strategy. Um, to level set on terminology, we'll put some definitions on the screen here. Um, Ravi, I, I, I know that you speak to customers every day in your role. Are you seeing this trend in your conversations? Is there growing interest in usage-based monetization? Yeah, ab absolutely, Chris. So before I get into what producers are telling us, right? So what you're showing is more modern or usage-based modern, modern monetization models, not the traditional that uh, we also support, right? So in, I mean, what you see as consumption here is a generic term that describes quantities being consumed against an entitled quantity, right? So they're buy and burn metered, something that is uh, consumed over a defined billing cycle, right? That's either daily, weekly, monthly, bi-yearly, or even annual, right? So uh, that's a producer's choice and of course things like outcome based monetization where customers pay based on a measurable value or outcome right now when we have conversations with producers right uh, they they have uh, some goals that they must achieve you touched upon the c suite and what matters to them uh, so th there are four to five related monetization goals uh, but uh, the the goal that is particularly met by the usage-based monetization models or people tilting towards these three 
areas right which your which your report says is a clear growth or are on a rise is uh, producers trying to build a predictable recurring revenue right and when when they do that uh, when they're able to build a predictable recurring revenue they enable an accurate forca forecast for their organization increase the company's valuation and in turn make their companies look more attractive for mergers and acquisitions right so this is a goal for producers but again when when we have those conversations arr means a lot to producer but they are also a voice of end customer because uh, licensing is an experience that goes beyond producer in hands of end customer and uh, the the goal that the buyers or end customers uh, see met by the usage based models is that they they want to pay for what they use right and and they want to move fast on making purchase decisions without having a lot of uh, process in place to procure a uh, long running contract and all that right which requires a lot of approvals and then uh, it's it's seen as an operational expenditure versus a capital expenditure uh, by the uh, buyers right so these are the two main goals why usage based monetization models are growing yeah. now there are many benefits that we have lined up later but if you look at the screen right now it's an interesting visual um, about uh, a, a a different form of monetization uh, model that is based on usage, right? We call it elastic token based or licensing as a service kind of model. Uh, producers are driving us to innovate in this area and such demand for usage based model and newer innovation in this area is a testament to why these are becoming more famous compared to traditional model and that reflects in your report now this this graphic just goes on to say that traditionally uh, you you might have bought a certain number of capacity uh, but you can never predict how much burst in capacity that your project teams are going to need during the course of your subscription and uh, to also add to some flexibility they might want they let's say they make certain uh, buying decisions and then they need capabilities from other parts of the producer's portfolio then usage based model which are more advanced and that gives a flexible access like elastic or token based uh, solve this problem of elastic capacity that you see where demands is going demands are going up and down during the usage and uh, cross portfolio need that they might need right now i mean we spoke about goals this new innovation that's based on usage based monetization model uh, and i said that i'll follow it up with some benefits of usage based uh, monetization model what you see in uh, the screen right now is the six categories that we have identified as the most important benefit for usage based models at flexibility where uh, producers can give more options to their end customers to buy and pay for what they use reduce friction in selling where they are trying to remove ba entry barriers for their end customers and make it easy for small mid-size and home users to buy their licensing uh, dynamic pricing is another benefit uh, where with base with the usage based monetization models they are able to uh, understand what capabilities are valued the most by their users and then adjust their price and packages based on value they get from their offers right uh, of course it also has characteristics of lowering the risk of piracy and overuse because customers uh, can have small and i mean s small value pay for the usage they need and 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 get that flexibility right and of course detailed usage reporting that you get because your usage is all tracked it uh, helps a producer identify potential upsell and across sell opportunity with the end customers right so yeah and same benefits from a 
buyer or the user's perspective are they are able to meet their on demand burst capacity or cross portfolio flexibility they might need from producer uh, under the flexibility benefit uh, they have reduced friction in buying too because when you are buying a, a paper use kind of model you're not going you're not committing to a big capital expenditure uh, it 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 minim, in, it minimizes uh, the risk of over procuring and not using with a perpetual contract uh, and and buy what they want and stay compliant with their licensing terms which is also important for many buyers these days and gain uh, operational expenditure versus capital expenditure is another benefit and then uh, they're accurately able to procure and charge a business unit or cost center uh, for the products or services that they need based on this usage based models right so yeah the, these are the benefits for producers and buyers of using usage based uh models uh right and and chris i think uh you have important pointers uh that you want users to take away from this webinar yeah yeah, yeah so I, I guess there's um a lot of advantages you just laid out Ravi, and it's clear to see why there's that growing appetite for usage-based monetization both from producers and buyers um so yeah that takes us on to our first future proofing tip which is essentially to embrace usage-based monetization. So if consumption metered and outcome or value-based models are all expected to grow by around 20% in the next 18 months, failing to adopt them could mean you risk falling behind the competition. Uh, but crucially, you need to be able to accurately measure usage before implementing these approaches. Uh, so Michael, I'll, I'll hand over to you for part two. Thanks, Chris. So we've just covered, you know, a lot of these usage-based models. Uh, but interestingly, when we look at what the respondents had to say about perpetual models, it's a little bit surprising, right? You know, everybody's talking about subscription for a long time now, um, especially with the growth of SaaS. Robbie and Chris just covered uh, usage-based models. Interestingly, though, you know, we look at these percentages. And it's a 17% increase in the expected use of perpetual models year over year. Um, Ravi, why do you think that is? Yeah, that's yeah. So, so Michael, I think uh, I mean we 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 deal with a lot of producers in this space also, right? Meaning uh, there are softwares who who have attained certain level of maturity, especially in the field of high cost EDA tools, and they're all. Uh, shaped by a long-standing contractual terms, and these contractual terms are influencing how the end end users are building ecosystems. The buyer or the end users are building uh, ecosystems, investing heavily in the on-prem computation or writing IT asset management solutions um, that that assume that the licensing is uh, perpetual, and they prefer those tools and ecosystem build around it to work uh, with them forever. Now, this explains the perpetual, long running perpetual contracts that producers have with the customers. But when these software producers enter these markets and penetrate deeper in these segments, the established practices that others have uh, used are things that the new customers are also looking for. So uh, they, they are driven by the uh, popularity and then they keep uh, demanding for perpetual models, right? Now, this doesn't diminish the ARR narrative uh, that we are talking about today. Producers have designed creative maintenance contracts to sustain recurring revenue uh, with their customers. So, yeah, uh, it doesn't come in as a surprise in certain market segments. Yeah. Yeah, and that that makes sense, Ravi. In, in my former life, you know, worked for. A software company that did engineering software. And we had customers that would not move off a certain version until the time was right. Uh, when they were done with you know, designing, modeling, simulating the product. Um, so perpetual licenses right. make sense for customers like that. Yeah. So let's move on a little bit and talk about deployment models. Um, no surprise, 
you know, SaaS seeing the greatest growth. But what is interesting, and again, I'm all, all about what's, you know, slightly contrary to what, you, you know, conventional wisdom is on-prem software is expected to grow. Um, and again, when we do a year over year comparison, 21% increase over last year's respondents. Um, that's interesting to me. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot and always see a lot about, you know, SaaS and cloud um, offerings, but for on-prem, you know, that growth is really interesting. And what I think that speaks to is sort of the shift from a cloud first way of thinking about things to a cloud smart version of thinking. And when we think about the way a lot of software suppliers are offering things, same with monetization models, right? You need to offer what your customers are interested in. And uh, especially if you're moving, migrating from on-prem to cloud strategy, you know, there's gonna be a time when you have these hybrid offerings. And some of the stats that we see from the monetization monitor point to the same thing. So yeah, 57% indicate that SaaS is a deployment model that will increase, but only 15% indicate that on-prem is a deployment model that will decline. So a little bit surprising, but again, it does speak to the way people want to consume their software, the way they want to access their software. And especially when you think about um, embedded software, for example, is, is another thing to think about. Um, you know, a lot of those situations are going to be air gapped, but you're still going to want to be able to um, make sure that you're getting the data back and um, entitling people and authorizing people to use those applications. And really what it all comes down to is your ability to grow over time, your ability to manage complexity at scale. So starting out, you may have a single product with a single deployment model, with a single monetization model. And that makes sense in the early days. Um, and oftentimes that's a homegrown solution. But as you start to mature, as you hear from other customers about, yeah, you know what? On-prem works, perpetual works, but for this product, or moving forward, we'd like to see that offered in the cloud, or we'd like to see that offered on a subscription basis, or especially now that you know these usage-based models are becoming more popular um, as a way of folks consuming software in a way that makes sense for them. They may not need it full time, but they'll have seasonal needs for it. You need to be able to support those models and scale. Um, and especially if you are starting to grow and you're starting to acquire companies where you're acquiring new products, new products that already may have licensing and entitlements built into them that don't map to your current system, you do still need a way to manage those entitlements um, with a 360 view of, of the way things work um, and not have each product in a silo. Yeah. And, and what yeah. you need to, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what you need as a producer, right? Like, why, I mean, it's clear that most of the softwares will eventually live on cloud, but it's not a flip of a switch. There's, there's likely some software that continue to run locally, run locally in a regulated environment where they, they, they can't talk to external world due to the regulatory requirements. And, and Revenera really offers a single pane of glass uh, across this complexity that you have to manage with the different license models, the product lines could be different. And, and, the, and, and this will help you streamline your port to cash process, right? Where your entitlement management becomes a single pane of glass across the SaaS on-prem applications that are being used by your customers across multiple product lines within your complex product portfolio, right? Yeah. So yeah, you really need a centralized uh, monetization strategy to manage that complexity. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a great illustration of it too, Ravi, where you see, you know, this hypothetical software vendor that has a couple of SaaS applications, a couple of, an on-prem application, different monetization models for each of those. And you really do need to pull it all together and make sure that your entitlement management system is able to communicate with both your CRM and your billing. And of course, the challenge for software suppliers is they have great expertise in developing software. So a lot of folks think early on, well, let's just you know leverage what we have or build it ourselves. And as I said before, when I was talking about managing complexity and scaling growth, early on, that may make sense. 
but we've got plenty of customers that find when they have to rely on engineering to do that, it comes at a cost. So some of the pros are, you know, if you're leveraging an existing system, for example, CRM, you know, you already own that system. The con is that it still requires, you know, additional development work, uh, new processes need to be mapped, and there probably will be some solution gaps because a CRM system or a billing system is designed to do certain things, not what an entitlement management system is designed to do. Um, and the same with homegrown. Um, you know, it could be a very specific tailored um, solution for your entitlement management needs. But the flip side is um, you're taking time away from your development team from delivering the functionality and the features that your customers are demanding. You know, you're like most software suppliers putting out roadmaps every quarter, getting folks excited about what's you know to come and what's uh, they can expect in terms of improvements to, to the products. Um, but if you're building yourself, you're accumulating technical debt. So you've got to go back. And if you want to change a model, you need to go back to engineering. Um, if you just even want to you know, keep it up with the latest trends, same thing. So you want to be very careful in terms of uh, going it alone and building it. And I think as most folks in our space uh, know, there's a lot of subject matter expertise involved and a lot yeah. of engineering skill involved in, in bringing these solutions to market. Um, and then, of course, you could decide to do nothing at all. And, and that's good because there's no investment, but it's bad because you have no visibility into what's going on. So especially with the importance of uh, annual recurring revenue, you want to make sure that you are able to move quickly um, and have a system that can support your needs. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And so as hybrid deployment and monetization models are growing, um, so does the need to streamline operations for licensing and entitlement management. And we are seeing more organizations take that centralized approach for their backend infrastructure. So 47% of monetization monitor respondents now use the same monetization technology across all product lines, up from 32% in 2022. Uh, 66% of those using centralized technology report they can collect product usage data very well compared to just 40% overall. So hey, if, if you are looking to implement usage-based monetization, then centralizing on a unified monetization platform can certainly help. 65% uh, of those using centralized technology believe that price and value of their products are totally aligned compared to just 32% overall, uh, so more than double the percentage there. And 93% of those using a centralized platform have moved at least some of their on-premises products to SaaS compared to only 55% using homegrown solutions. So Michael, Ravi, I, I feel like there's some really compelling data points here that back up everything you guys have just covered when discussing how to manage the complexity of hybrid deployments. Uh, Absolutely. And, and that takes us to our second future proofing tip, which is to centralize hybrid strategies. So, to gain complete visibility into customer accounts via that single pane of glass uh, and improve your ability to measure usage and deliver value. So, this takes us to the final part for today's conversation. And we're going to tackle some of the biggest barriers to revenue growth. Uh, Coming in at number one is delayed time to market for new features and enhancements uh, reported by 54%. Customer acquisition, of course, that will always be a challenge, but perhaps the move to usage-based models can help there if, if you can align your sales strategy with how customers want to buy. Uh, then we have customer churn rate at 41%, which of course is critical. You wanna do all you can to boost retention uh, we have an inability to adopt new monetization models also at 41% and an inability to optimize the quote to cash process at 21%. So for those of you in the audience, I'm sure you can relate to each of these issues, perhaps to varying degrees. Um, and hey, it just so happens that Rebonera has solutions to help overcome each of these hurdles. So this is aggregated data from customers using Rebonera's monetization platform and how it can facilitate top line growth uh, with the ability to quickly implement new licensing and packaging models, accelerate 
time to market and revenue recognition with that centralized approach. Uh, between a 10 to 15% uplift in revenue from existing customers with the ability to identify upsell and cross-sell opportunities. Uh, this is interesting, a three to 10% increase in channel performance with self-service capabilities and shared visibility into data, um, and a five to 10% boost in subscription and maintenance renewals with that proactive data-driven approach to monitoring customer health. And again, knocking down those barriers to growing recurring revenue with a 360 degree visibility into customer entitlements, helping you support renewals and retention, uh, giving you more predictability for revenue and your customers better insights into costs and the value they receive. Um, so Ravi, could you yeah. talk us through some yeah. of the metrics that, that should be measured yeah. when taking this proactive approach to recurring revenue? Yeah, so so yeah, you, you talked about uh insights right so 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 it's it's really data driven usage based models help you as producers uh get that insight and 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 what you really need i mean i'm i'm just going to cover three aspects of it but there there are a lot of actionable insights that a producer can use to optimize their quote to cash process right and and have an absolute monetization strategy in place. Now, the renewals report provides a comprehensive and up-to-date overview of uh, your customer's renewal position and, uh, I mean, renewal positions. You need this information along with some information of the entitlement owner and the map, the products that are map, mapped to those entitlements so that your customer success team is adequately equipped and is proactive to reach and assess a health of a renewal and take necessary step for uh, keeping your customers aligned and stuck to your product, right? So, so, so renewals help uh, that kind of cause. There's another um, report. Uh, we what we use. Uh, to refer as a high watermark, this is a true use of your software, right? So the high wa high watermark uh, report provides insight into your customers' usage patterns of specific capability or a feature in an application. So this this these reports are meant to be created out of the transaction that happen at point of access, meaning that when your products are using certain capabilities that are bought, then the high watermark captures how those uses, usages go up and down over the time. What this helps uh, you as producer is to understand the, your customer's pattern over the time. And, uh, and, and you could have notifications created for custom thresholds that will help you as producers to reach your customer and uh, capture that upsell uh, opportunity, right? And, and and sometimes producers use this report for kind of overdraft or overage billing situations also. So, so th this is another insight of true usage of your software, right? The high watermark report there. And, and again, if, if, if you're really, uh, measuring the engagement. So this report is called fulfillment report. What you need as a producer here is that we the entitlement is something that uh, your customers can use in all. They have placed an order for, for it versus what are the use rights that they have exercised, right? right? So it's not necessary that they bought an entitlement and they're using it to its full extent. Uh, they, they you, I mean, their business units are slowly going to exercise those use rights as needed. A, a, a low utilization on these kind of fulfillment reports is a red flag that your customer is not really engaged after your initial purchase, right? And a high utilization is an indicator for a upsell or talking to them about other products in your portfolio, right? So the fulfillment report really enables you to see if they are exercising the use rights that they have bought. And then uh, 
uh, if and 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 it's just going to give you more uh, insights into uh, an upsell or underutilization. So yeah, this is again an actionable insight for a producer. Yeah. Great, thank you, Ravi. Um, that brings us to our final future proofing tip for today, which is to monitor risk and demonstrate value to tackle churn and ultimately increase customer satisfaction to boost retention. Uh, and again, if you take these three steps, you'll be going a long way to keeping your C-suite happy with streamlined operations, reduced risk and increased annual recurring revenue. Um, I know that we've shared lots of statistics and data points with you today, but um, I hope you found this analysis useful. Um, please do access the monetization monitor reports if you haven't already done so. They're available in the handout section or head to revenera.com. You can download them there. Uh, if you would like to learn more about any of the areas we've covered today, uh, please reach out to your account rep or um, you can contact us via the website. Um, but Rabbi, Michael, that yeah, yeah. Today's conversation. yeah I'll, I'll just jump in, you know, and sort of help wrap things up a little bit and give folks a chance to ask a question if they'd like. You know, when you actually step back and you and you look at something like what a market leader like Microsoft is doing with Office 365, that's a great sort of use case, right, for what other software suppliers should be looking to do, right? So you look at Office 365, you can use it on-prem, it's on your desktop installed there. Uh, it could be on your mobile device. It could be accessed through the web. They have different subscription levels. They have different pricing and packaging. Um, they have different elements of consumption too, right? At different packages, you might be entitled to a certain amount of storage or things like that. So when you pull back, that's a great example of some of the things we've been talking about today um, in terms of having a centralized monetization solution that can handle hybrid scenarios in terms of deployment models, in terms of monetization models, um, and the data that you're getting from usage too, right? So you understand, okay, are things priced and packaged correctly? Are there certain offerings that get seasonal use that might be best offered in an elastic way? Um, again, give the customers what they want, how they want it, and how they want to buy it. So yeah. Yeah, and 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 the Office 365 models also, Michael, are meant to suit certain market segments. There's personal, family, business, enterprise, mm -hmm. educational, government, nonprofit kind of packages that you have. I think Office 365 is a great example that shows the the varied deployments and deployment models that your customers could adopt and the mm -hmm. kind of packaging that they would expect from a supplier, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely conditioning the market to buy in a certain way. So yeah. got to follow suit. And then that's what the monetization monitor data is showing, right? I mean, and it's quite a substantial report, like 450 leaders at global technology companies contributed to this data. So, you know, it, and, and the fact that it is showing those that increased demand or expectation for flexibility and usage-based models, then yeah, that, that's certainly a good case for, for adopting it, or you do risk falling behind the competition. For sure. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, let's do it again sometime. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank, Thank you, Ravi. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.